Hello, and uh, welcome to this, the ninth episode, actually, of our uh, Palia and Palliative Care Journal Watch. Welcome. We've got a really uh, full program today and a full panel with some new faces as well. So with that, then, let's jump right into it, because today we've got five um, articles to cover. Um, so we really want to make our use up our time as best as possible. Um, again, a quick background for those of you uh, for whom this is the first time joining Journal Watch. This keeps you up to date on the latest peer-reviewed palliative care literature. And we have a team of palliative care experts from the divisions of palliative care at some Canadian universities. And today we have a first again in that we've added to the universities and, and the list of colleagues joining us. Previously, it was McMaster University and Queen's University, and we've now got some folks joining us from University of Manitoba, University of Alberta, University of Toronto, and we're going international. We've got a colleague, uh, Dr. Sholof, from the Hadassah Hebrew University um, a Medical Center um, in Israel, who's also helping us monitoring. He's not on today, but he's helping us monitoring the journals. Now, we regularly monitor over 20 journals, and what we do is we look for journals, that we articles that we think will either change the way we think about something or confirm what we are doing. And we bring this uh, to, the, uh, to the sessions and share them and discuss them, hopefully informally as a panel. And we're very open to comments and questions from, from you folks as well. Now, this is a journal watch. It's not a journal club in that we don't go into in-depth analyses of the studies, but we do do our work beforehand to try and identify only those that we think have got uh, robust um, methods. Now, the Palliative Care ECHO project is a five-year national initiative, um, and we're really building communities of practice, and this is one of those communities of practice. It is supported and funded by a financial contribution from Health Canada. And so the views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. And we have to state that up front by our funder. So what to expect from today's session, we'll be doing five articles, as I said earlier. We'll also be providing you at the end with a list of honorable mentions, papers that didn't make it to the top five, but we think are really worth looking at uh, and reading. Please submit questions through the Q&A function. And the session is being recorded and will be shared with registrants within the next week. And then within a few weeks, then it'll be open for, um, for access um, by anyone else who's interested in accessing. And the number of people accessing it are going to thousands. So we're really um, excited about the spread of this, not just across the whole of Canada, but also internationally. And do check the Pad of Care Journal Watch podcast. These sessions are turned into podcasts and put on the Pallium um, Echo uh, website. So very quickly, I'm Jose Prayer. I'm a professor in the Division of Pad of Care, at the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. I'm also a scientific advisor and co-founder of Pallium Canada and currently doing a stint at, um, at University of Navarre in Spain, where I'm professor at the Faculty of Medicine. And let me introduce you now to Aingaran Sinaraja. Aingaran, if you can say a few words about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. I work out of Queen's University and at Lake Ridge Health, uh, where I am a part of care consultant and chair of one of the research chairs. Thanks. Great to, to have you here. I think this is the third podcast that you join us um, on. And the new person on the block, Jesse Solomon, over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jesse. Um, I'm an internist and palliative care physician. Currently, I'm a palliative care physician at the palliative care unit at St. Peter's Hospital in Hamilton, and I'm affiliated with McMaster University. Excellent. Thank you. And my co-host, Leonie. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Leone here, and uh, I just finished my five-year term at Queen's University as the head of palliative medicine there, and on to some new and exciting adventures, which I will reveal to you at our next episode, so stay tuned. That's one good way of bringing people back. Thank you. <laughs> Disclosures, Pallium Canada is a not-for-profit organization, and over the years, we've been funded mainly by Health Canada. Um, there, are, there are also revenues from partnerships with, for example, provincial ministries and um, health service uh, providers and organizations. And we also have revenues from our LEAP course registration um, and sale of the Pallium Pocketbook. And that's what keeps a lot of activities going. 
I do receive a stipend as scientific advisor at Pallium Canada, and uh, Leone, JC, and Eingeron have got no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. So, our featured articles today, uh, quite a few of them, and one of them, and looks like I draw the lot to present that one, is, is, is quite complex. I'm going to try my best to try and simplify the findings. But it covers a broad range of topics. The first one we're going to look at is hospital culture and intensity of end-of-life care at three academic medical centers. So very relevant to those of you who work in acute care centers. The second one is the effects of palliative care for progressive neurological diseases. And we thought we'd really highlight this. Um, it, is, it is such an important area. And we're beginning to see more and more literature in this area. And, and that is the article that is long and pretty complex. Then we're going to be looking at um, interventions to promote communication about goals of care. Uh, what's fantastic about that paper is it's actually such a simple intervention, I think. Then the other one relates to a topic that is a big buzz and I think will become a very big, is already becoming a big thing in healthcare and in society, and that is artificial intelligence. And in this case, um, the, uh, the issue of patients looking up information um, on their heart failure. Uh, using artificial intelligence. And then lastly, we'll look at the important role of physiotherapy um, for patients with palliative care needs. So I'll get the ball rolling. Um, and the first paper is a paper by Elizabeth Zeng and colleagues published in JAMA, Internal Medicine, um, uh, this year. And the background to this um, is that there is substantial institutional variability in the intensity of end-of-life care um, that is not explained by patient preferences. So there are other dynamics happening in the background, and they thought they would specifically look at it, um, the hospital culture and institutional structures. So by that, they mean things like policies, practices, protocols, and resources that might contribute um, to potentially non-beneficial high intensity life-sustaining treatments near the end of life. So the goal of this study was to understand the role of hospital culture, as I said, in everyday dynamics of high intensity end of life care. And I love the, the research question uh, because I found it really easy to understand. And the research question was, what is the role of hospital culture and institutional structures in the provision of potentially non-beneficial high intensity life-sustaining treatments near the end of life? The methods they used very appropriately was a qualitative study and they used a comparative ethnographic approach. They conducted the study at three academic hospitals in California and Washington. Um, and interestingly, they chose hospitals that differed in end of life care intensity. And to determine those hospitals, they used the Dartmouth Atlas and some of the definitions that used that's using the Dartmouth Atlas about um, end of life interventions. They then conducted semi-structured in-depth interviews, and these were conducted by two of the researchers. And the participants uh, included clinicians, administrators, and leaders in those hospitals. They used purpose of sampling. By that, they meant they went to look for those clinicians, administrators, and leaders who worked not only in the front lines of care, but also in management and right up to senior leadership. And the interviews were held from December 2018 to June 2022. And when I saw this, I couldn't help but thinking um, a lot of this could have happened during the pandemic and what was the influence of the, of the pandemic, which started basically March 2020. Well, at least the shutdown in North America was in March 2020. The data, um, so then they, they, they basically went through the usual method of qualitative analysis, identifying codes and then um, in, uh, themes that came from that. And the coding and theme was done through consensus by five researchers. So they really used a robust qualitative uh, method approach. So the main results, 113 participants and similarities were noted between experiences at low intensity and me medium intensity hospitals. So they clumped the low intensity and medium intensity hospitals into this one category that they called low intensity. And that was quite distinct from what was happening in the high intensity hospitals. So they discovered that the Dartmouth definitions they used actually were spot on, that indeed, when they started listening to the participants, those participants were describing practices that aligned with the Dartmouth's definition of what's a hospital that's high intensity end of life interventions versus lower uh, intensity. Um, 
potentially non-beneficial high-intensity life treat, treat, um, sustaining treatments occurred at all hospitals, um, as well as defaults towards high-intensity care. And the participants said this probably reflects cultural norms in the US. However, and this is important, respondents at each of the three sites also describe these distinct cultures that they found in their respective hospitals around um, end of life care and the intensity of care that is provided end of life. High intensity care was particularly notable at the high intensity hospital. And in the low intensity hospitals, people described more of a receptiveness towards palliative care and a mindset towards de-escalation of intensity of treatments compared to the high intensity hospital. The authors wrote a proactive considered efforts among multiple care teams were required to de-escalate high intensity treatment. So it's difficult for one individual to come into a setting, be it an internal medicine unit, I presume, or ICU, whatever unit, um, and to say, look, I think we need to de-escalate these treatments. I don't think that these treatments are appropriate or aligned with good end of life uh, care. It often took several people, a team, um, to work that through. Um, it is more difficult for one individual to make the change. And efforts to de-escalate were vulnerable to being undermined at multiple points um, during the patient's trajectory and the treatment by any individual or entity. And then respondents at different hospitals reported different policies, protocols, resources, and practices. And some of them encouraged de-escalation of non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments and others discouraged um, de-escalation. In terms of the strengths and limitations, I thought it was a very robust qualitative study, large qualitative study. Um, the limitations were, the author said that there may have been some other differences between the hospitals that may affect the intensity of care. And this includes things like economic incentives or patient population demographics. And again, they remind the reader that this was done in three US urban academic medical centers and may not necessarily be generalizable to community hospitals or other countries. So the key point, study describes the significance of hospital culture and institutional structures in resisting the default toward high intensity life sustaining treatments. And um, I wanna end off with this one line that they wrote and that was hospital cultures need to be considered when developing policies and interventions to decrease potentially non-beneficial high intensity life sustaining treatments. So with that, let's open up to the panel and then to any of you out there, feel free to ask questions Comments as well will be very welcome. All right, who are my colleagues here? Want to... Maybe Jesse, you work in a acute care hospital and probably have some insights, at least from the Canadian perspective. I, I actually have insights from the Canadian and the American perspective because I did my good, yeah, medicine yeah. training um, in Pittsburgh for three years, and which was at a high intensity hospital an academic hospital. Then I did my palliative care fellowship in Boston, also at a high intensity hospital. And this, this study did look at academic hospitals, which in and of itself might be um, biased because you have learners, maybe you want to do more investigations, you kind of can get excited about esoteric diagnoses. And in general, you might just be ordering more things in general, just because of the nature of the environment. And when I look back to my training, I actually found that there was also cultural differences when I moved to Canada so much. First of all, the training, the care, incredible in America, the training, the care, incredible in Canada. One theme that did feel a little bit different is perhaps the emphasis on medical liability felt a little bit more intense in the United States compared to when I moved to Canada. Mm. Could that be mm. influencing things potentially? Mm. And for me personally, having gone through internal medicine and palliative care and going from training in internal medicine fellowship in palliative care, becoming an internist first, where I was a hospitalist, then full-time palliative care. So I've kind of done a bit of shifting. I think actually the biggest change for me in terms of how I chose to practice my intensity of investigations of interventions was actually most modified 
by my palliative care training. Now that's mm. a mm. that's a lot to ask for people to do. So the question is if that's effective for me, would that be effective for others? How does that get trickled down to others who don't have time to do one or two years of fellowship? But it did help me be more judicious in what I order. And I still have the same temptations at St. Peter's Hospital, where we do have x-rays, we do have blood work, compared to, let's say, hospice, where those things aren't necessarily at your fingertips the same way it is here. So I still Mm -hmm. flirt with those temptations even here. So there's always that tension. (laughs) Very good. I, uh, perfect uh, on this panel, JC. Leonie, I, sorry. I see some some questions uh, about the whether the hospitals had palliative care consultation teams and if there was a difference between the high intensity and the lower intensity hospitals in their engagement and um, and and access to palliative care. So there was actually. I'm actually pulling the paper out right right here. Um, so they did not go into details on the um, on the the, uh, um, the actual service. They didn't describe the specific services in in those hospitals. Um, but it sounds like from the reading that the one or maybe the two low intensity ones that there was palliative care. But I'm I'm also cognizant of the fact that sometimes colleagues in palliative care end up in these high intensity hospitals, and it takes years. It takes a process of diplomacy and convincing to to try explain and try and teach and try and try and train um but obviously this is qualitative study so um you know not designed to look at any causal effect between the the presence of a palliative care team um, and and what transpires i'm just looking through the paper right now but you can go on to the next question in the meantime yes exactly um and um, Rachel's wondering if the author shared any specifics about how the protocols and policies differed that um, between those high intensity and low intensity hospitals and the cultures thereby that they promoted. So in the paper, they actually provide a, a fascinating conceptual framework. I didn't show it because if I was to show up on the screen, it, it looks complex, but it's actually not really complex when you start looking at it. And they provide examples of these policies and they provide examples of the protocols. So it's institutional protocols that that help de-escalate intense, in, the intensity of care, things like um, structure of DNR and comfort care order sets, the co-management services. I presume they're talking there about palliative care and the um, um, and the service protocols, such as comfort care huddles or geriatric bundles. And under institutional policies, they speak around things like the transfer of patients to and from the hospital, um, uh, policies around brain death evaluation, and then there are metrics and incentives as well um, uh, around policies uh, related to end of life. Institutional cultures, they describe examples such as ethical priorities and institutional values, um, ease or difficulty of establishing consensus and receptivity to palliative care. I wonder if there's any last thoughts because we'll have to move on to the next article, but certainly it brings to mind why um, the, actually the urgent need for the course that you you developed, Jose, called Leap Leaders, to really look at equipping healthcare leaders in the institutions and those of us who work with those healthcare leaders to really help them understand how imperative palliative care is and how we can change the system. I think that course is so well suited uh, for this discussion. Anything you want to add about that? Um we hope, uh, and and we are seeing some results around um, changes uh, culture um, in a in a in a, a health service, a hospital, a unit, and we're hoping to condense that course into a much shorter course. Good. So let's move on to the next one, and the and the next one is the is the toughy. So hang, so t- uh, tie your seatbelts and hang in there, and let's go for it. Um, it relates to the area of palliative care for persons with progressive neurological diseases. Um, The authors start off by pointing out the prevalence of progressive um, neurological diseases, and they give the examples of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and motor neuron disease. And they point out that it affects more than 56 million people worldwide. I was actually surprised by that large number. 
They explain that these diseases share some common symptoms and needs, which are characterized by mobility dysfunctions and then also non-motor symptoms, symptoms such as uh, pain, uh, fatigue, urinary dysfunction, cognitive impairment, depression, and dysphagia. And they highlight that patients with progressive neurological illnesses experience substantial distress and burden and reduced quality of life. And then they go on to say that because of all that, um, we are seeing increasingly nationally and internationally guidelines and organizations calling for the integration of palliative care in the care of these patients. The authors then also summarize some previous work done in this area and um, a study by Oliver and company in 2016, by La Turaca in 2019, and then Walsh um, in 2016 as well, and basically summarize that although there are studies there showing some impact, overall, there's limited evidence of impact found. It doesn't mean that that there is no evidence, except that the studies, that, and they're often small studies, um, heterogeneous, so difficult to compare them, um, haven't um, found a very large body of evidence. So the goals of this group was to determine the association of palliative care for progressive neurologic diseases with patient and caregiver-centered outcomes. Apparently, in these previous studies, they had not looked at the caregiver um, experience or impact on the caregiver. So the method they chose was a systematic review and a meta-analysis of randomized control trials and quasi-experimental studies, which included pilot studies and their focus was adults with progressive neurological diseases and that included dementia multiple sclerosis parkinson's disease uh, motor neuron disease uh, multiple system atrophy etc and also the studies that included um, caregivers they searched five databases they used the usual approach a solid approach of two reviewers and then the team um, ensuring the bright papers were selected they undertook a narrative synthesis um, and they also looked at quality of life, symptom burden, caregiver burden, and satisfaction with care. Um, and that was um, in the um, in the meta-analysis. So very quickly, 27 articles were included, 15 trials with over 3,431 patients, different interventions described, including interdisciplinary teams, home visits, palliative care clinicians, spiritual care. Most of the interventions actually were multi-pronged strategies and then nine studies evaluated caregiver outcomes. And I'm going to point out to the table. So this is my attempt at summarizing um, the quantitative synthesis that they did. So in, to, in the domain of quality of life, there were seven trials. When they looked at the studies of those seven trials, three reported st statistically significant improvements in the palliative care groups compared to the usual care, in other words, no palliative care. And then when they did the meta-analysis, um, which included six of the studies they found palliative care was not significantly associated with better quality of life. In the area of symptom burden, uh, there were some studies that reported improvements. And then when they did the meta-analysis, indeed, they found there was significant um, a better symptom management in the group that received palliative care versus uh, usual care. And the caregiver burden, some studies, so four out of the nine reported reductions in caregiver burden, but then when they did the meta-analysis, they found no significant difference. And then when they looked at satisfaction of care, all four of the studies that were included in that domain reported higher patient satisfaction with palliative care versus usual care. Um, and the meta-analysis confirmed uh, this finding. They also went on to do a qualitative synthesis. So they looked at patient outcomes, caregiver outcomes, quality of care outcomes, palliative care in nursing um, homes, and again found uh, some studies reported uh, impact, others not. So it looks like there's signals from many different studies that there is benefit. There are also um, findings that some studies don't seem to show a, um, a an impact. So um, one of the limitations they identified was that a lot of these studies are heterogeneous, so it's very difficult to compare them, um, and the small, relatively small number of trials. In terms of the summary, palliative care is likely to improve symptom burden and satisfaction with care among patients with progressive neurological diseases and their caregivers, while its effect on quality of life and caregiver burden remains inconclusive. And this was directly from the, from the authors. And they identify specific interventions that do seem to make a difference. When they did find a difference, these were the elements, interdisciplinary team, 
palliative care clinicians involved, home visits, um, and spiritual care appear to be associated with more impact. And then they obviously concluded by saying we need more studies. I love the study because it gives a glimpse of um, palliative care in this patient population and I think sets the sets the stage for further studies that need to be done to really identify when it does have an impact and when it doesn't. So with that, then over to the panel. Yeah, I also thought it was a really important study and so very well done. Uh, and perhaps the you know lack of strength of the evidence is, might be related to the heter heterogeneity of um, the palliative care that's being provided in these different studies. And, and certainly that um, will be one of the factors in this situation. Um, we have a question regarding how it was interesting that they grouped the, the different types of neurological populations together. And um, obviously some of them like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's have very different trajectory and needs. Mm. And mm. does the study differentiate between these groups at all? Actually, they do. So as I said, it's it's a big study. And they actually did do some sub-analyses, so subgroup sub -analyses, analyses with these different diseases. And if you read the, both the introduction and the discussion section, they do highlight previous studies looking at the specific disease like the dementia or the multiple sclerosis. So the, the findings were also mixed when they looked at the subgroup analyses, but I won't go to it into, uh, into it in depth um, in the interest of time here, but do look at the paper. They did do some subgroup analyses. Great question. Any thoughts from Jesse? Uh, I've just know, I when I looked at the chart of all the different studies, there were four North American studies and three out of the four did show a, stati a statistically significant exactly. improvement in patient quality of life and caregiver burden. Why that is, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe further analysis has to go into that. And I know that spiritual care was very important in determining if there could be a benefit. And of those four studies, only two of them did have spiritual care. So you can't just account for the spiritual care piece of that three out of four showing statistically significant results. It's interesting. One of the papers that they did not identify was one by colleagues of ours in Toronto by Kieran Quinn, who did um, a very large study looking at different disease groups. And I can't remember, I don't know if any of you remember whether that study also looked at, I know that they included dementia actually. They did look at dementia. I'm not sure about the other neurological diseases, but it looked like it was more about randomized control trials of different interventions. Whereas the, the study by Quinn looked at what I think is another very important parameter. And that is, did it make any difference in terms of hospital admissions, emergency department visits and, and home deaths? And, and I think if I remember correctly, that study found mixed results in the dementia group, in fact, found higher hospitalizations in that group, whereas in patients with advanced heart, lung diseases, cancer, more home deaths occurred when there was early palliative care involvement or provision. Good. Okay, so I, um, any, any other comments there, questions, Leonie? No, That's... we'll have to move on to Eingeran's paper. Thanks. Right, good. Eingeran, or... Oh. Thanks, Eru. Thanks. Um, so um, Jose gave a, a preview of this paper that this is a, a pragmatic study looking at early, encouraging early advanced care planning conversations. Um, and so I really like this paper because this is an implementation related uh, event. It's not just go do it, it's how to do it. And that's what I liked about this paper. Um, and they reference this earlier interventions that this group has done on outpatient side, and it's called the Jumpstart Guide. And so it references other papers that you'll have to go look, where they looked at patient surveys and clinician surveys and gave lots of guidance that is very patient specific around having earlier conversations. But the challenge with that is that is very it was very resource intensive, lots of you know patient surveys needed, uh, very time intensive because the the, the project had to review what was done and not done and evaluation was also very time intensive. And so this project looked at, okay, how can we leverage electronic medical records to perhaps do some of these things a bit more automated um, and see whether we can improve goals of care conversations or discussions. 
Um, so it's a parallel one-to-one -one, uh, randomized controlled trial of the Jumpstart Guide versus Usual Care. It was three academic hospitals um, and um, included a one community hospital and two teaching hospitals. Patient inclusions included anybody who was older than 80 or if they were older than 55 with the presence of one of these nine chronic conditions, so conditions we are all uh, familiar with, kidney, heart, dementia is in here as well. The excluded patients who were already receiving comfort-focused care, they've already gotten part of care involved or already had a documented course of care conversations. And then there was an automated EMR email that went to the clinicians. Um, it actually had specific example language of what words and sentences to use. Again, that's based on the Jumpstart Guide, which is a separate paper. Um, and this email went to the attendings, but also the resident teams on the, um, the resident physicians. And then they also got a page saying, you got an email, go check your email. Um, and then they used, again, computers, natural language processing to then evaluate and look at whether the goals of care discussion actually happened. Um, and just uh, uh, they, they called out that simply having a code status order was not considered a goals of care discussion, which, which makes sense to me. And so the key results were, so, you know, lots of patients were enrolled, um, you know, 2,500. Uh, most of them were white. And the primary outcome was that 34.5% um, in the intervention group did end up having a goals of care discussion. Uh, but even in the usual care group, it was actually quite high. It was 30%. So there was a 4% improvement. And they did look. They also looked at the differential impacts on uh, race and ethnicity. And it looked like there was an even bigger impact on non-Hispanic white population of 10%. There was no impact on any secondary outcomes like ICU, emerge visits, length of stay, et cetera. And on the right-hand side, it's a, it's a small, uh, you may not be able to see this. Um, again, I would encourage you to look at the paper, but they give you an example of what that specific language looks like so uh, for example you know it, it gives the clinicians guidance on you know you don't have to address all the topics at once um, you know you could simply say that you know uh, i want to find out what's important to you so that we the provider can provide the best care for you so that's how you start a conversation so there's some example language there um, what abilities are important uh, to you that uh, you can't um, live without them so again, example language that um, uh, is, uh, I think clinicians will find helpful. So in summary, the guide was helpful. It increased goals of care conversations. Um, remember in the outpatient, that was the earlier study I mentioned, it, that was actually a much bigger improvement um, because and, and in that study, they also had a patient facing version, which this study that I'm talking about today does did not have, just simply be, to make it more efficient. Um, so therefore, the magnitude of increase was small, and it's unclear what the clinical significance is. And perhaps you need more than this intervention to, to, to improve it even more. It is still unclear whether the quality of the documentation is good or not. And it is also unclear whether future clinicians will be able to find this documentation easily in the future, because that's another probably important part. Um, and perhaps the intervention does help with equity um, deserving groups. and perhaps providing an uh, even bigger uh, improvement for them. Um, I liked it that, in that it is a pragmatic design. It, it seemed very efficient. Um, you probably do need EMR technicians to help out. And so that is a separate conversation we can have. And this brings to mind what Ontario is doing. A lot of hospitals are on Homer that the Breuer Group is leading. Um, similar ideas, uh, screening for patients with um, uh, advanced illnesses and then recommending best approaches. Um, and I think there's one more slide that um, uh, that to me talks about how it's not just enough to say we need education, we need to have policies that you need to do more advanced care planning. Now I think we are into the realm of actually implementing change management and what does that all look like in the new world with EMRs, there's probably room to leverage there. Um, and that is I think the next steps as well. Um, and then the limitations is one region only. Uh, we'll have to think about the natural language processing. That is not a reality yet in a lot of EMRs. And so still some work to do. I'll stop there and open it up to the panel. Angaran, so if I understood correctly, I read the paper, right? So basically using this AI capability, 
embedded within the electronic health records, they identified patients who met criteria, um, and these are the criteria, I think the ICD-10, that were patients who most likely required um, these type of discussions. Um, and then they, um, they sent an email to the attending clinician of that patient and so that jump start has got the patient's name the disease, et cetera, and says hey consider having these discussions with this patient is yeah. that correct and it's correct. pretty straightforward right it's just simple prompts about what to say and getting the conversation going agreed agreed and, and, and that first screening part doesn't necessarily have to be the true ai where they you know to me ai is about looking at a large set of um um, natural language, um, okay. whereas looking at ICD codes is not even AI. That is much more it's simpler to implement, yeah. okay. um, and a lot of EMS should be able to do that. Yeah. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Igran, there's a question regarding how long they followed um, the practices for to determine if goals of care conversation had taken place. Uh, was it 30 days or was it a bit shorter? Because um, Dr. Whiting is pointing out that in family practice, you'd only see a small portion of patients in a 30-day period. Well, well, just a reminder, this is hospitalized patients. So this was not an outpatient. So it was based on that on that hospitalization until they were discharged, discharged. I, I'll see if there was any day limitation, uh, but my recollection is that, it was, again, it was hospitalization. So it's till the end of hospitalization. But that earlier paper was outpatient, and it probably had different uh, time periods. Um, I did not get, go into details with that paper. Yeah, I don't think that there was any limitation of how long they were in hospital, just that they had to be randomized within the first 96 hours of admission. I think this conceptually, paper ties this in be, nice. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jose. Go no, ahead. So conceptually, this would obviously also apply in different in other care settings as well, right, including primary care with some tweaks, I suspect. Yeah, so sorry, I'm just looking at the abstract. So it, it was within 30 days, goals of care discussions. Okay. Of the randomization. Sorry, Leonie. Thank you. Sorry. I think this paper ties in quite nicely with the first one. It went as well around hospital cultures and um, change management, and that, you know, it's great to have an intervention like the M Homer, for example, but implementing it in tandem with a, a, a well thought out. Um, stepwise approach that actually is going to shift culture in order to make a difference for care. And I think you can, you can see that quite well in this study that it's, it didn't really change outcomes at all and all the secondary outcomes they measured. Very good. Any comments? I'm just looking to see if there, I don't think any other questions. So perhaps with that, we can move to the next one. Thanks, Ayn and Jesse, over to you. Okay, so this paper was a letter to the editor and it was looking at the um, the chat the use of chat GPT in advanced heart failure. So maybe we should give a little bit of background on chat GPT. Chat GPT exploded into our consciousness several months ago. And it's my dark horse for person of the year, times person of the year in 2023. So you heard that here first. And I asked ChatGPT what ChatGPT was, and it gave a three paragraph answer, but basically it's a very sophisticated chat bot, which is trained on huge data sets. And as long as you give it certain types of parameters, it could spit something out that feels novel, it may actually be novel. So for example, if you have a 65 year old whose birthday is next week and they love Shakespeare and they also love country music songs, you can put all that in it and it'll spit out this funny song lyric that's in Shakespearean tone and can make you look very smart actually when you use it correctly. So it's, it's a funny tool, um, but it's also had some applications where it's, passed the United States medical licensing exam. So also not just for fun, but it's actually been challenging some professional exams and it passed. And there's now, it's very topical um, because I think it's shaken a lot of the fabric of society in some ways, worrying that could we be replaced? In fact, I asked 
ChatGPT if it will take my job as a doctor. And it said, no, I won't take your job as a doctor. And it listed five things about how it'll work with me. And um, it'll be a, a tool to be used alongside doctors. And if I was ChatGPT, that's what I would say if I was playing to take my job in all fairness. So kudos to ChatGPT if that was its ultimate goal. So <laughs> this, this article, um, it looked at several different domains in terms of heart failure. So it looked at, in terms of uh, the role of palliative care to advance cardiac devices, medications, recognition of end of life symptoms and advanced care planning. So it asked ChatGPT several questions and it wanted to know what its responses were. And it was hit and miss. Um, so for example, one of the misses was when it was talking about, should I switch off my automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator, it said that um, it may not be in the patient's best interest to deactivate if there's a high risk of sudden cardiac death. Now we know that there are many patients who say, I don't wanna live longer. I, I don't wanna hasten things per se, but if this is making me live longer, then it, I, I don't wanna be artificially kept living longer. And they may choose to, um, to stop their ICD or, or deactivate it. So that would be within their goals of care. So that would not be an appropriate response. And there were several others about opioids and respiratory depression and NSAIDs, I believe, for for maybe for dyspnea, et cetera, I'm not sure. But it, it, the overall theme of this article was to show that chat GPT is not ready for prime time with regards to, I mean, we could be specific and say advanced heart failure, but I think it's pretty obvious um, that it's also easily extrapolated to healthcare in general. In fact, many of the times when you put in something to chat GPT, it says, please consult with your healthcare provider to discuss this further, et cetera. My, my worry is at what point in the future, because it's not going to be today, they're, they're, they're not going to be my boss today, in the future they might be, but at what point will we say it's credible enough that we could actually use it? And it will happen. I, I don't doubt it's going to happen because even a few months ago, I didn't even know this existed and it's already um, proven that it, it does have some use and at least a ton of potential. And that the way I think about it is at right now is the worst it's ever going to be. It's only going to get better. So it's hard because at what point will we be confident enough? Maybe it'll be really obvious. It never, it almost never, from what I understand, answers the same way to two separate people. So if I type in the same prompt, I might get a response and someone else across the world or right beside me might type in the exact same prompt and get a slightly different answer. And over time that might change. So it's an interesting concept. It's got a lot of implications and this is such a hot topic. So I'm just gonna hand it over here to the, the panel. I'll, I'm gonna jump in if that's okay, Jose. I, I think this whole area of the use of AI and chat GPT in particular is so interesting and it has so many ethical and legal challenges, but um, its ability to fabricate things and make up facts is what scares me and, and to say them as if they're facts. So I asked ChatGPT uh, to find papers on a particular research question that I had, and I'm pretty up to date on the literature in this research question. And it came up with some articles that were very recent in 2023 that I had never heard of. And I thought, how could I miss these? In fact, they were fabricated articles. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they had never existed. I know we've all heard about that uh, situation with the lawyer who actually used um, case law examples in his uh, that were also fabricated by Chat GPT. So I think it's this it its ability is going to be limited by some of those types of uh, errors. And then I think in the article it also pointed out about if you're using it to look at patient data. Is, are there any ethical implications in it, of it incorporating some of that person's patient information now into its database? Like, I just think there, there are more questions than answers, but it's a very exciting, interesting area. 
So I think the, those fabricated references you're referring to, I think that they, the language is hallucinating, right? That the AI is hallucinating. No, really, I think that's the language that they use. Um, Jesse, did they did they describe whether it was or, or which version of ChatGPT? Because I was recently at a conference, um, the Amy conference, the international the international medical education conference, and there was a lot of talk about uh, ChatGPT and AI. And it seems like there's a big difference between the version that's available for free, which is three, I think it is, versus four, which is paid for. It does not look like they specify which version it is. Because it'll be interesting. Um, I, I know there's some researchers even looking at it, see if there's a role for it in qualitative research analyses as well. Angron, I think you were going to... Well, well I, I mean, I think this is one of those, um, I think what Jesse mentioned, right? Like paradigm shifting that we don't even know yet what it can help with yet, right? Like it, it'll just, I think, fundamentally change some of the things. So the education one I was impressed with, I was practicing, um, uh, I, asked, uh, I, I was using Bing AI, which I think is using an older version, but still, I asked it to pretend it was a patient, and so it was like a, like a uh, practice simulator uh, scenario where I practiced um, breaking bad news with it and asked it to rate how I did, and it was it was it was reasonable. I can see, like even as a palliative care expert, like I found the answers very helpful, and I can see for new students, other doctors um, uh, who want that practice. I can see that being helpful, and so there's lots of areas where once it stops the fabricating, even this top palliative journals right like maybe we just ask it to tell us the top five that we should be talking about every five every month um perhaps right in the future very good i, I did have a deja vu feeling when i saw it because i was reminded of study a study that i did way back in 1995 when the internet had just sort of arrived and and uh uh, people were beginning to look up information about cancer. So we looked up, we did a study exploring what is the information that they're getting about complementary therapies. And our conclusion was the same. Beware, beware, um, you know, user beware. Um, and I think there's some really fantastic stuff now available. Tracy, over to you again. All right. So the last study that we're going to be talking about is looking at physio physiotherapy applied to palliative care. So this study was done in Spain. And um, the aim of the study was to assess the effect of physiotherapy using four different scales. So there's the Barthol index, which is a measure of someone's ability to complete ADLs, the functional ambulation category scale, which is the level of independence for ambulation, palliative performance scale, and the Braden scale, which is a predictor, uh, risk predictor of uh, pressure injury. So the way that uh, the way that the study was designed was it was to business as usual. Physicians were supposed to select patients in the palliative care units that they thought would benefit from physiotherapy. So the team, um, I went on the website because I want to learn a little bit more about who the members of the team were in this palliative care unit. So it says that the um, the palliative care unit is made up of doctors, psychologists, social workers, nursing staff, physiotherapists, music therapists, spiritual and religious care services, volunteers, and cleaning services. So the reason why I made note of that is there's not occupational therapy listed there. And I know that um, a, a long time ago, um, from what I understand, is that physical and occupational therapy did have joint training programs and now it is much more common i believe in canada for there to be separate so i'm not sure exactly what um who shared the role of occupational therapy if physiotherapy took this on more at our palliative care unit we have a phys physiotherapist and an occupational therapist so i'm just making note of that maybe nuance there um, so the study participants, 92% were oncologic patients. Um, and it's not clear exactly um, about the breakdown of the non-oncologic. Um, what we do know is um, looking at their baseline PPS, it was actually quite high. Um, so for example, like 86% had a PPS baseline of 50 or higher, which is 
quite high compared to, let's say, our palliative care unit at St. Peter's. The vast majority of patients here at St. Peter's, and probably at this time 100%, all have a PPS of 40% or lower. And the reason why I mentioned that um, when looking through the study is it does appear that patients who have more mild disease do seem to have, um, tend to have a, a larger or confer a larger benefit compared to patients who have more significant disease burden. So that has implications. Um, the other part that I wanted to uh, make note of is um, the, actually wait, I think I already said that, was the other results. So for example, it showed that prior to treatment, 44% of participants had total dependence according to the Barthel index and 58.7% were non-functional ambulators according to the FACT scale. And at the end of the treatment, the number of patients with total dependence decreased to um, 50, uh, to 23.8% and those non-functional ambulators to 19%. Like that's tremendous, that's fantastic. So um, I was quietly hoping for a positive result on these scales, but I also know that physiotherapy does so much more than just show results on the scale. So for example, I was thinking about in our unit, if we never had physiotherapy or occupational therapy. And I would worry that if that never existed, it may give the false impression that PT or OT isn't important because people are just here to die. Whereas the presence of PT or OT gives hope for patients that there is hope for improvement and it does reinforce goal setting, function preservation and quality of life. So. Um, it did show some positive benefits for sure, but there's also things that weren't captured in the study that I find are very important too. I'll turn it over to the panel for any comments. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I thought this was an interesting study because I think it does highlight, as you very nicely described, the importance of the therapy area, so the physiotherapy, occupational therapy. I was surprised though that they didn't reach back to where this actually started. So there was fantastic work done with physiotherapy in in Edmonton way back in the early 90s and in fact in in if, if I remember correctly 19 about 1997 um, Terry Cossa and Eduardo Brewer and the team there in Edmonton published a paper on an instrument called the EFAT the Edmonton Functional Assessment Tool which is specific design for patients with palliative care needs and receiving uh, palliative care and they published um excellent results on a pad of care unit. And then in 2013, uh, a colleague of ours uh, who was at the time in Ottawa and now in Brampton, Martin Chasen, uh, published a paper in Current Oncology on Palliative Rehabilitation Program that we had set up when I, when I was in Ottawa as part of this project and one of the co-authors of the study. And we found um, of 100, uh, if I remember correctly, 116 eligible patients for this outpatient palliative rehabilitation program, um, 67 completed it. And the program was about eight weeks um, and patients also had a higher PPS. But we took a look at why did some not complete it? And we found that those that, 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 that did not complete it had much higher C-reactive protein levels. So uh, a, 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 an indicator of inflammation than those who were able to complete it. There we go. And I uh, see uh, Nancy Brown has also posted that cancer kicks in the rehab program at McGill, uh, which I think um, uh, Martin Chase was actually involved in that as well. So thank you for bringing that to it, our attention. Um, very quickly, in the interest of time, I see we're coming towards the end of our session. Um, honorable mentions are a paper on primary palliative care, um, improving uptake of advanced care planning among patients with advanced cancers. There is a paper on the effectiveness of integration of a palliative care team in the follow-up of patients with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There is a paper by Chow and colleagues on missed opportunities to ease suffering an explanatory model of occupational therapy, utilization in end-of-life care. So uh, Jesse, I think that goes to your theme as well about the, the, um, the role of the physio and, 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 and occupational therapy. 
There is a paper on stigmatizing language expressed towards individuals with current um, or previous uh, opioid use dis uh, disorder who have pain and cancer. And we know that that's a very big topic. And then lastly, there's a paper on neuropalliative care for progressive neurological diseases and a scoping re review on models of care and priorities for future research. So we encourage you to look at those as well. They'll be posted online. So you'll be getting a link to the recording. And then um, shortly, you'll be finding the, um, the podcast. And in the podcast, I listed the, um, the studies as well. So with that, and I don't think there are any other leftover, are there any questions or comments, Leone? Uh, there was just a comment about the different types of palliative care units and um, Valerie was yep. just saying that not uh, there aren't very many places in Canada that would have a patient profile like this. And so I, had, I just wanted to raise the question of there are many different types of palliative care units and an acute tertiary intensive palliative care unit is actually geared towards this type of patient population and Jose founded the intensive palliative care unit in Calgary which I was subsequently a director of and it was exactly this type of patient with a PPS of about the a similar and intensive um, interventional supports including physio and I think we do that is a, a, a conversation to continue about how we improve access to those types of units in the Canadian landscape. And we hope to have a paper in the future, in a few months, that yeah. looks at these different models. That's right. Very good. There's, there was also a comment from Ben Robert. Ben works in long-term care and posted that he had asked ChatGPT4 um, what sort of models you should look at in, to integrate part of care in long-term care and reports that he got excellent um, feedback from ChatGPT. <laughs> so we'll, stay tuned. We'll see how the future unfolds with, with ChatGPT. Good. Um, so thank you to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us, Jesse, for your first time. I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more of you and your colleagues at St. Peter's. Angeron, always fantastic to have you on uh, on the panel. Um, Leonie, again, who does so much work in the background, thanks to a fantastic team that helps us um, at Pallium with us, Diana Vinch, Aliyah Mamdeen, and James O'Hearn. And then listed are all the folks who are monitoring the different journals. And I think by next time round, in two months' time, we'll probably have some, have some extra people joining us. So to everyone, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Um, and go out and improve palliative care in long-term care in the different settings you work in. Um, and uh, caution for the time being with, uh, with chat GPT, but there might be some interesting stuff on the horizon. Thanks very much.